so would you mind introducing yourself, please, ma'am? I'm Angie Rasmussen. I'm a virologist at the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm also an affiliate at the Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security. Uh, so I wanted to quickly ask you a really basic question. When, um, when people talk about uh, like the coronavirus nucleic acid, are they just talking about like fragments of um, the viral RNA? It depends on what kind of context you mean. Um, if you're talking about PCR, uh, that then you know PCR amplifies a small piece of that. So it can be either amplifying fragments or it can be amplifying uh, the entire genome. Um, sometimes uh, you can design the PCR so that it's only detecting the subgenomic RNAs, um, which are only produced when the virus is actively replicating. Um, but most of the, the PCR assays that are used for diagnostics just detect RNA, period, genomic RNA, subgenomic RNA, whatever. Okay. So if um, this is in the, in the context of um, some of the long COVID studies that are going on, um, and if they are finding evidence of viral uh, nucleic acid, is that the same as finding viral RNA? That's correct. Yeah, there's no DNA um, part of the, the virus life cycle for SARS coronavirus 2. It's all RNA. So that's what they're referring to. Essentially just traces of the virus. Maybe um, it could be viral debris, could be, um, yeah. It could be residual RNA. It could be a low level um, replication. Uh, this has been reported not just in long COVID, but since the very beginning of the pandemic, it's been observed that people who've recovered from COVID will test positive um, with PCR for, for sometimes months at a time. Um, it's not really well understood the significance of that, but it's, if it is a persistent infection, it's not one that's producing a lot of infectious virus. Um, several studies have been done now that have showed no onward transmission from those so-called repositive cases. Uh, and there's nobody, to my knowledge, has ever cultivated um, infectious live virus from, from samples from those people either. Yeah. Um, though I have to say that, that the study that the Dutch did, which is completely different, um, looking at um, the uh, infectious virus coming out of um, fully vaccinated uh, people, I thought was a really interesting study, um, looking at potential for onward transmission and finding that it was reduced. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I think that that work is really important to do. And I think this has been one of the, the most confusing things um, throughout the entire pandemic is the inability of PCR to detect infectious virus. And then a lot of people say, well, why aren't they always looking for infectious virus instead? And the reality is that it can be very, very difficult anyways to cultivate virus from clinical specimens. Also, it requires um, a, a high containment lab um, and specialized skills and it takes longer so that's why it's usually not done, um, or at least it's not done as, as often as PCR is. And PCR is really, um, well, now there's rapid antigen tests and, and other ways too, but up until more recently, PCR was, was generally the gold standard for diagnostics in the clinic. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to quickly talk to you about variants. Um, there's been some um, stuff in the news, obviously, um, the particular um, variant that was identified in uh, and reported on in South Africa, and now um, some commentary on Mu. Um, can you give me your sort of thoughts on where we're at with the emergence of new variants? Well, I mean, we're, we're kind of where we've been uh, since really throughout the whole pandemic. Um, anytime that you have uncontrolled transmission, you're going to see the emergence of new variants. Um, now we've seen enough variants to know that some of these mutations are convergent and uh, they, they do appear to provide some advantage to the virus, including some of these mutations um, that, that have been found in mu and in uh, C12 um, that, that appear to, to confer some ability to evade neutralizing antibody responses. But it's important to, to communicate that just because a particular variant has these mutations, just because it has a lot of those mutations, doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna be worse or that it's gonna outcompete other variants of concern. Um, it doesn't mean we should also just be like, no problem, uh, but, but we should definitely keep an eye on those and watch their spread. Um, anytime, for, Mu, for example, is a variant of interest, 
uh, because it has spread out of Colombia, whereas where it emerged um, to other countries, but it remains to be seen if it's going to outcompete other variants, including Delta, which appears to be um, really dominant in every population that it's been in so far. Do you think our understanding of what constitutes uh, fitness with the coronavirus is right now mostly a story around transmissibility? So I think that it's, it's complicated, right? Because fitness means something to virologists that it doesn't always mean to the general public. So fitness just refers to a virus's ability to replicate more efficiently, um, more robustly to, to higher titers that doesn't always equate to a difference in transmissibility in the real world. Um, there's also infectivity, which Delta, for example, is also more infective. Uh, some of these more immune evasive mutations appear to be giving the viruses fitness, in, or sorry, infectivity advantages because they improve the binding with ACE2, meaning that they make it uh, more efficient for the virus to enter and infect cells. But again, both of those things don't necessarily equate to a, a meaningful difference in the real world. Now, with something like alpha and delta, both of those um, are more fit and infective viruses, but they also do have a real world clear advantage um, with delta having a, an advantage over alpha. And it appears that advantage is based on transmissibility rather than on infectivity or immune evasion. So right now, I think that's where the focus is for a lot of people because it, it shows really that in real world conditions over and over in multiple populations, transmissibility really does seem to be the, the key feature that a variant needs to have to become the dominant variant. Do you think that may change as more people are vaccinated and more people have experience, well, and, uh, fewer people are immunologically naive to the coronavirus that fitness may start to shift to um, being um, more immune ev evasive? I don't. And the reason why I don't is that I have not seen any data that, that really shows that viruses are spreading like crazy in vaccinated people. Um, you would expect to see that potentially the, the vaccines themselves and the immunity that they induce could potentially become a selection pressure that the viruses would have to get around. But in order for that to happen, the viruses would have to be transmitting efficiently between um, immunized people. And really there's, while we hear a lot, especially um, in Canada and in the US, and I'm sure in Australia too, we hear quite a lot about breakthrough infections and what all that means. Um, and it, it certainly is possible for somebody who's vaccinated to become infected, to become symptomatic and probably to transmit the virus onward, but it doesn't look like that is driving the majority of the transmission. We're not seeing the hospital filling up with vaccinated people. We're not seeing you know, huge case clusters in entirely vaccinated groups of people. What we're seeing is uh, mostly unvaccinated people still making up the bulk of the new cases um, with some vaccinated people thrown in there, we're also seeing that the vaccines protect very well against severe disease. All of that together, again, doesn't mean that there's no transmission occurring between vaccinated people or there's no replication, but it does probably mean that it's very reduced in vaccinated populations. And that makes it a lot more likely that, that a variant is going to emerge from vaccinated people. The other issue is just how the immune system works. Um, this is not like developing resistance to an antiviral drug or an antibiotic. This is not one thing the virus has to get around. It's really thousands or millions of things in the form of antibody, antibodies and T cells. And many viruses just don't have the ability to, to completely evade this. Even something like influenza, where there are many subtypes, many different strains circulating, um, doesn't really ever completely evade immunity, even if it can cause some infections. So I'm, I'm really dubious that we are going to start seeing completely vaccine resistant variants emerge. So far, even the vaccine evasive variants that have emerged like beta and gamma um, have not emerged in response to, to vaccines. They've emerged in unvaccinated populations. And the reason they, they have emerged is that they have an advantage in terms of infectivity, what I was talking about earlier. They're better at binding ACE2, the virus receptor, it just so happens that the receptor binding domain of the spike protein is also really important for neutralizing antibodies. 
So if that gets mutated to make it a better receptor binder, uh, that means it's going to not necessarily be as good of an antibody binder. Um, and that's how those, those vaccines are evading immunity. It's not because they are actually adapting to immunity and then evading it. It's sort of incidental. Great. Um, I, I was watching um, a Grand Rounds presentation that Monica Gandhi um, gave uh, a week or so ago, and, and she talked about how the um, beta coronaviruses are uh, kind of like a DNA virus wannabe um, in that they're way more stable than most single-stranded RNA viruses like influenza, for example. Um, uh, is that fair? I don't think that's completely fair. Um... Now, what she's probably referring to is the fact that SARS coronavirus 2 and other coronaviruses have an exonuclease protein that does have some proofreading capabilities, meaning it has a lower mutation rate than most other RNA viruses, but it also still has a higher mutation rate than most DNA viruses. It also has a smaller genome, which means that sort of mutation for mutation, uh, you, you're likely to get a mutation in a place that's important um, to the virus, you're, you're more likely to do that with a, a 30,000 base pair genome um, compared to a DNA virus that would have a 100,000 to a million base pair genome. So, um, so it's not really a very good comparison. Um, I would say that it's, it's not like a DNA virus. It doesn't have the stability of DNA for sure, um, but it's not as mutagenic as an RNA virus. Now, on the other hand, um, unfortunately, because there is so much transmission occurring, that does give the virus more opportunities to acquire more mutations because every time it replicates, it will acquire mutations. And maybe it's not as fast as Ebola or influenza or other RNA viruses, um, but it's still faster than a DNA-based uh, organism or virus. Um, and it's still getting far too many opportunities to acquire those new mutations. Okay, and so it seems like we're seeing these um, constellations of, of uh, mutations within certain variants. Um, and is this sort of a cumulative thing where um, as the viruses uh, and these variants are circulating um, and as they, um, uh, they are acquiring you know, some uh, additional um, deletions or substitutions or changes, um, some of them will be you know, redundant and make the virus kill the virus <laughs> and some of them may confer some advantage and and with the ones that confer some level of advantage they obviously are the ones that will um, predominate is that sort of how this works with the accumulation of, of these constellations you just described positive selection pretty well i think um yeah that's exactly what happens so mutation itself is random um the the process by which a virus gets and, and loses these mutations is really random. Um, it's whether or not those mutations happen to randomly occur in a spot that gives the virus some sort of advantage or disadvantage. A disadvantage obviously um, will either eliminate that virus sort of from evolutionary competition uh, or at least give it a severe disadvantage so it will be outcompeted. Uh, a mutation that gives some kind of advantage will eventually become the dominant mutation and the dominant variant. And that's really what we've seen over and over again um, with alpha and now with delta. Um, these, these variants come along that have these advantages and they all have emerged independently. Then you get them into the same community together and essentially you get to see who wins. Um, and right now, delta is pretty much winning everywhere. Do you think that there's some um, testing bias in that um, we've now really globally stepped up on the surveillance for um, variants, and now we're, you know, we're we're finding um, more variants, and and that gets sort of translated almost into scariants because people are, you know, they're finding um, a, a triple um, mutant and DNA, uh, what was it, Delta Plus, and all kinds of uh, things that have caught on in the media, which sound really sexy, but how they translate in the real world in terms of you know, having a clinical significance seems to be you know, a different story completely. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of bias. Um, there's certainly bias in terms of sampling. Uh, there's virtually no genomic surveillance in some places, and there's very spotty genomic surveillance in many places otherwise. Even in the US, um, in some of the communities that have been hardest hit, 
with SARS coronavirus too, there's not necessarily a lot of genomic sequencing labs nearby. And so fewer samples will get sequenced. Um, in many cases, you know, in many countries, including again, the US and, uh, and not so much Canada, the UK is probably the world leader, but um, there's, you know, people are having to use their own grant funds, their own research funds to do some of the sequencing because there weren't dedicated funds for it. There wasn't national infrastructure for it. So certainly we're, we're collecting samples that are heavily biased to basically who can do that type of genomic surveillance. That's really not the way that genomic surveillance should work. And this is something we obviously have to build and improve upon. Um, but I think that the other issue is that there is a bias in the sense that people haven't been educated about biology and how specifically molecular biology works. Um, so they, they hear the word mutation and they think either, you know, something terrible, um, some type of experiment gone awry uh, or cancer or like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or superheroes. Um, and mutation is really none of those things. Mutation is the driving force behind evolution, but really what it is, it's not a sentient force. It's not something that has an intention. It's, it's a random process that basically occurs because we are imperfect biological beings and uh, the enzymes that replicate our genomes make mistakes and the enzymes that replicate viral genomes make even more mistakes. Um, and so, you know, they, they get more mutations. Um, it also has to do with lifespan. A virus can replicate, you know, in a number of hours, whereas we reproduce, um, you know, once every 30 years or so. Um, and we have far fewer offspring, obviously. So evolution in the human population is on a much longer time scale than evolution in a microbial population or a viral population. And people see this that mutations occurring all the time people aren't mutating like this, um, you know, so what's, what's going on? This has to be really bad. The virus is, you know, going to beat us in this evolutionary arms race. And that's really just not how it works. I mean, we've, our mutation uh, occurs on a much slower time scale. Um, our evolution occurs over millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years, but our immune systems are actually capable of, not mutating, but adapting to the pathogens that we encounter. So people really should um, feel comforted in that the virus, yes, can, can evolve more quickly than we can, but we've evolved to counter pathogens that can do that. Um, so really what we should be thinking is not ignore the variants, they're not a problem, they're definitely a problem, but we also shouldn't assume, oh my God, we're doomed um, because the new scariant has, has hit the media. We should be vigilant. We should continue to take precautions because there is yet to be a variant that's emerged that is transmitted in a different way than any other SARS coronavirus 2 variant. We need to keep getting vaccinated. We need to keep taking precautions to reduce transmission um, as much as we can. And we need to do better genomic surveillance and keep an eye on these emerging variants most importantly, though, we need to stop creating opportunities for new variants to emerge. That means we have to take away opportunities for the virus to replicate. Yeah, um, excellent. You, you covered that extremely well. Um, I, and I, do you feel like we've covered the variants question pretty well? I think so. Excellent. My previous Without, and now I can look at you again because the, these Zoom interviews are always so hard because I'm like uh, listening to you, but I'm staring at the thing that says Zoom meeting, so uh, I don't I, look like I'm like looking down. <laughs> I uh, I have a real conscious thing of not looking at me because um, over the last year and a half, my face has just chubbed right up like the rest of me, and so it's oh so, god, it, tell um, me about it. It's <laughs> so I just like to be the COVID nineteen, right? Yeah, oh, god. <laughs> So um, my last question, I was uh, talking to David Canaday at Case Western, and he's just published a pre, well, he's released a preprint <clears throat> that looked at um, a very small group, I think about 170 um, people who got two shots of Pfizer affiliated, uh, connected to nursing homes, nursing home residents and their carers. And <clears throat> they observed a age related um, uh, impact on levels of antibody um, six months after the second dose. Um, essentially, that older people um, started at a lower baseline and the, the decay was pretty consistent with um, the 
younger healthcare workers, but essentially they, they figured that um, after six months, a, a fairly substantial whack of them, about 70%, had um, very low levels of neutralizing antibodies. Um, obviously, that doesn't correlate directly to protection, um, but you know we're starting to pick up some signals on um, the need well, the question of whether we need um, third doses. Do you have any thoughts yet on, on this? Is this in your wheelhouse? It is in my wheelhouse. Um, I'm not a, a hardcore immunologist, but certainly I'm familiar with all of these data. And, you know, this really isn't surprising. Um, I think that, you know, one thing that people haven't considered as much is that People over the age of 65 often have different vaccine formulations and different vaccine regimens because it's known that with age, your immune system and the responses uh, to vaccines and to infections um, becomes less robust. And really, that's why older people are susceptible not just to COVID-19, but to, to a number of other infectious diseases or more susceptible, I should say, than, than younger people. Um, so it's not terribly surprising that that vaccine uh, durability might be waning, particularly in that population. But it's also not surprising that, you know, with these vaccines, we tested them in a two-dose regimen to get them out to the larger population as quickly as possible. Um, that, that really didn't take into account that one of the reasons that normally vaccine trials take so long is that they do do a number of arms to try to find the optimal formulation for dosing. And there are many, many vaccines that do require three doses of vaccine, um, particularly, and we don't know this for mRNA vaccines, but for subunit vaccines, protein vaccines, um, many of those are less immunogenic over the long run um, and have less durability. So you do often need to get that third dose um, at a later date. We also, when these trials were conducted, they were designed to have the shortest possible interval between doses. And sometimes, uh, and some studies have shown for all of these vaccines, as well as for AstraZeneca, that extending that interval between the two doses leads to more robust immune responses. And whether they're more durable or not, that remains to be seen because unfortunately, durability really can't be sped up. You just have to pretty much wait and see what happens. But it wouldn't surprise me at all um, to find out that, that these vaccines probably work best when there's a third dose administered months after the first two doses. Um, that, that would be consistent with how a lot of other vaccines work. It also, I think the thing that mystifies me the most about this is the notion largely spread by people who work for vaccine manufacturers that we're gonna be needing new boosters every six months. I don't think that's true at all. I mean, the immune system is really remarkable and it does have capacity for lifelong immunity um, with the right kind of booster dose regimen. We have some vaccines like the MMR vaccine that we all get in childhood where there's years long intervals between doses. Um, and that does provide lifetime protection. Personally, in November of 2019, back when we could still travel for fun, I went to Southeast Asia and there were a number of measles outbreaks occurring in some of the places that I was going. So I had my measles uh, antibody titers checked. You know, I haven't had an MMR shot in, in over 20 years and I still had uh, strong IgG measles titer, anti-measles titers. So I think that people really um, shouldn't be alarmed uh, if we discover that because Obviously, this was an urgent situation. We needed to get those vaccines out as quickly as possible. It's perfectly consistent with what we know about other vaccines, as well as how the immune system works, that we may need to have uh, an additional dose or two of these vaccines at longer intervals apart from each other to provide that durable immunity. Um, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be getting COVID shots all the time for the rest of our lives. No, I, I think that's really sensible um what you just said um i thought i think it's it's great that um groups like the case western are doing um these antibody um uh surveillance sort of studies um because obviously you know real world is is kind of what we want but we don't want to be in a situation where we're suddenly seeing a lot of uh delta led outbreaks in nursing homes killing a lot of folks um and then thinking oh we should have been boosting them so having Exactly. 
early signals of um, what's going on in, at the uh, humoral level is um, obviously very important information. I agree. And I think that, um, so Friday, the, the WHO is having a blueprint um, roundtable meeting uh, to talk about the development of correlates of protection. When we have reliable correlates of protection, and these are laboratory measurements that you can use to evaluate vaccine effectiveness in the absence of actually having to, to evaluate it, um, once we have those, it's going to be a lot easier, I think, to make these decisions about recommending additional doses. Because we do have to be balancing, you know, the need for additional doses with the need for other parts of the world where nobody's been vaccinated yet at all, or the vast majority of people have not been vaccinated. Um, and, you know, it's, it's more complicated than that because it's not like booster doses in the U.S. or Canada or anywhere else are suddenly going to be available to, to go to another country. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Um, but I do think that we need to, to be, we need to get correlates of protection as soon as possible so that we can really optimize these dosing regimens, both in countries that already have access to vaccines, as well as around the world, because really that's what our end goal needs to be is global uh, herd immunity. And do you think the correlates of protection will differ across age groups? Because we know that older people are probably going to have fewer naive T cells and you know, their immune complex is going to look different to somebody who's 20. It's entirely possible that you would see um, different subsets of immune correlates of protection. Um, and, and that's also not uncommon either. I mean, people, again, certainly by age um, will have different, different responses to different vaccines. As we see vaccines um, start to be authorized for children under the age of 11, it wouldn't be surprising to me if we see different correlates of protection for them as well, in part because it's actually uh, different trying to evaluate vaccine effectiveness in a population that is not susceptible to severe disease in the vast majority of people. Um, people who also might be getting different doses. Uh, so younger people um, in some cases may be getting a lower dose of these vaccines um, that would change it too. So it is going to be really important to get really accurate, um, reliable correlates of protection because as those kids who are under the age of 11 get older, um, you know, what if they have a different boosting recommendation? What if somebody like me who is uh, pleasantly younger, middle-aged, um, you know, what, what do I need to do in, in 10 or 20 years um, when, I, when I do get to that older age uh, that okay, 20 years, um, where vaccines, you know, might not work as well in me. Um, so I think it's really, really going to be very important to establish what those are. And that's going to make surveillance um, and optimizing these dosing recommendations a lot easier as well. So the, the WHO meeting, that is obviously not going to be able to take into consideration any data from the human challenge trials in the UK, because they have only just sort of figured out what virus they're going to give them, I think. Yeah, I mean, this has been my problem with human challenge trials from the beginning. Um, first of all, they don't really speed things up and the data that we can learn from them really is somewhat limited. Um, I'm glad that they will be generating usable data. And I should add that the, the WHO meeting on Friday is a meeting for people to gather from around the world, from public health agencies around the world, from member states and talk about what data they have um, and people can deliberate about it. It's not any kind of decision-making uh, body. Um, it, it really is more like a forum for, for researchers and public health officials to come together and go over the data in its totality. Um, those recommendations will be made by individual countries, uh, public health agencies. Many of them will probably follow official recommendations and guidance that the WHO provides. Um, but not always, as we've seen. Uh, so really, ultimately, it's going to be individual countries, I think, that are deciding um, what these vaccine recommendations are going to be like. Um, probably there will be scientific consensus about what the, about what the correlates of protection are, um, but that's going to be different for every country, too, because every country has different ages, different demographics, um, different comorbidities, uh, different risk levels of the people living in all those different countries, and certainly different health systems with different capabilities to, to actually surveil this and get vaccines out accordingly. So it's really, um, 
you know, it seems deceptively simple that why can't we just decide on a lab measurement and make these recommendations for everybody because we're all human beings, but it's not so much the science, it's more the implementation where uh, there are a lot of country specific challenges. Yeah, the interpretation, um, especially to, you know, different backdrops of um, uh, pr uh, previous exposure to SARS-CoV-2, would that make a difference as well? It, it certainly could. Um, we know that people who previously had COVID um, will have a more robust response to the first shot of a vaccine, pretty much an equivalent response to the second shot of the vaccine, which is very different from a naive person who has a little response to the first shot and then a much more robust response to the second shot. Um, what that all means for durability, what that all means uh, for, for protection, um, what protection means, whether that's protecting against symptomatic COVID-19, protecting against you know, severe disease or protecting against infection altogether. Um, this is what makes it really, really complicated to try to figure and sort all of this out. What about the, um, the, the sort of signal that was um, uh, discussed in the letter to the JAMA that Moderna um, may raise antibody levels to a higher level than, than Pfizer? Do you think um, that uh, it's just one little data point, we need more validation um, to understand that, or do you think it may be significant? I mean, I think several studies have kind of indicated that now, and what I'm not sure about is the, the significance in the real world. Um, I think that there's probably a lot of explanations for that. You know, the both vaccines are different doses. They use a different uh, lipid nanoparticle um, to deliver them. Uh, the nanoparticle, the LNPs themselves can be adjuventine. Um, they can enhance immune responses. So that might be different. They might also just uh, be more efficient. One might be more efficient than the other at delivering the mRNA payload to the cells that are receiving it. Um, there's a lot of reasons I think that might be different. Um, there's also the extended interval. It's only a week difference between Pfizer and Moderna, but we've seen um, that you know sometimes a week could make potentially a big difference. Um, and when you're looking at this at, at population level, um, you, you really are gonna, if you see something over and over again in a bunch of different studies and different cohorts, um, it probably is true. But to me, the real question is how significant is that in terms of the protection that's conferred? Is there really a big effect in terms of re a reduction in protection or durability from Pfizer versus Moderna? I'd be really surprised if we start to see different recommendations being given for Pfizer versus Moderna. I'm actually also really surprised, and I think it's gonna be hard in a lot of places to try to get a handle on that, in Canada, for example, they they have been recommending mixing and matching vaccines, and each province, I'm sure, is keeping track of that. But if you know one person's getting AstraZeneca and then Pfizer, and one person's getting Pfizer and then Moderna, and one person's getting, you know, Moderna and then Pfizer or, or whatever, um, it becomes very difficult to do a really well um, well uh, planned longitudinal study like that one that you referred to. So I don't think we're gonna be able to make too many head-to-head -head comparisons. I think we're gonna to have to, to make broad vaccine recommendations that really apply to all these vaccines. And I would be shocked if the US doesn't follow suit in terms of starting to recommend uh, heterologous or mix and match regimens, because that really is gonna make it a lot easier to get people vaccinated. And I mean, what, what happens if it's, oh, we're gonna recommend a third shot, but you have to get Moderna if you got Moderna before and there's no Moderna anymore in your community. I mean, it's just going to be really, really challenging to get people dosed the way that they should be if they're, they're really restricted to the first vaccine that they could get. Um, plus, there's a lot of data that, that shows that there's really no harm in mixing and matching vaccines, which again, is not surprising because we've done this plenty of times in the past. Um, you know, how often do you ask what brand your flu shot is. Unless you're allergic to eggs, it probably doesn't matter to you that much. Um, so I think that, you know, we're going to have to be more flexible with allowing people boosters, um, just because I think it's going to be really, really hard to do more studies like that one that you just mentioned in JAMA, which was 
you know, a, a well-designed, I thought well-controlled head-to-head um, -head comparison of those two vaccines. Okay, yeah, because that story I wrote uh, got like 2 million um, views on Apple. And I was like, well, this is only meant to be like one single data point, um, you know, putting it out there. But um, yeah, like, clearly there were a lot of people interested in that. Um, so I was a bit nervous about how it might be interpreted, but um, there you go. Uh, I've taken up lots of your time. You've been incredibly helpful. Um, is there anything that you want to mention? Just get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs>